a top 10 list. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up with my top 10 list from what I heard there of ways to teach professionalism in medicine. And these will be in ascending order. So I'm going to start with the least effective way to inculcate professional values in medical students and move up to what I think is the most effective way. And unfortunately, I will also say that the least effective ways are the easiest. And the most effective ways are the hardest. So, start with number 10, ceremonies. <laughs> we do this a lot in medicine. Almost every, almost every school in the country now has what's called a white coat ceremony. Um, it's often done at the very beginning of medical school. Um, even before you've met your first patient, you are being imbued with the powers of the gods in medicine. Um, and, and in fact, you'll, you'll note a touch of sarcasm in the voice here because there have actually been now some criticisms of this as potentially um, being counterproductive. That uh, giving someone this ceremonial induction before they have really started to be socialized into the medical culture and the community and the knowledge base and all that um, could actually be harmful. Nevertheless, we do this um, and they're you know, usually uh, accompanied by a nice speech and people feel good about themselves. Um, number two, swearing an oath. Uh, sorry, number nine. <laughs> So this is the problem. I did this on a word processing program and it automatically numbers them. <laughs> so you're going to have to correct me almost every time, I'm pretty sure, unless I do it now. So swearing an oath, often done as part of the ceremony, um, usually an oath over which the students had no control and therefore uh, little reason for personal buy-in. Um, but. Nevertheless, it is an explicit, you know, I, I like this personally because it is an explicit statement of the values of the profession that you are joining. And one of the things I think we struggle with in medicine, uh, maybe this, there's an analogy in law, I actually don't know. Um, we struggle a lot with the issue of professional <coughs> autonomy. Um, and I, I'll just spend two minutes on this because a lot of people in medicine have come to believe that professional autonomy means something like, I've been through the training, I can do whatever I damn well please. And that's, to me, something a lot more akin to personal liberty than professional autonomy. Because remember I said professional is a group, professions are groups. So professional autonomy means we as a group have the right to establish our practice standards. That's not the same as individual liberty. In fact, it's a constraint on individual liberty. So professional autonomy to me is not something that you can use to justify, you know, deviant practice standards. In fact, professional autonomy is what requires all of the rest of us to say, you're practicing in a way that's unacceptable to the group, and you're going to need to come in line. So um, that is something that I think we need to do more about, is that have explicit conversations in medical school with students about what do you take on when you put on the white coat and sling the stethoscope around your neck? What are the assumptions? that patients are going to make when they come to see you. And you can't just have your own little code of ethics that you keep to yourself. You are signing on to our code of ethics. So, you know, if you don't like gay people, sorry, you're going to take care of them. And you're going to do just as good a job as if you love, you know, gay people. Or, you know, and I, I, you know, I'm at risk any time I start giving examples like this, but um, that's the kind of thing that I think we need to be very clear about. There are professional ethical standards, and even if you don't think they're right, you're signing on to a group that has agreed to them, and the, the path for changing it is to go to the group, not to practice on your own and say, ah, professional autonomy, I can do what I want. 
So swearing of oaths, I think, is important because it establishes that set of shared standards. And, and personally, I think when we start talking about oaths and codes, we should speak more explicitly about, look, you're signing on to this. So if you don't like it, here's how you change it. But you don't just decide you dislike it and therefore aren't going to adhere to that part of your oath. And you know, some of this has to do with uh, malpractice issues and so on. If you, if you go, go rogue um, and they pull the code of medical ethics out at, in court, you're going to look bad. So you better have a very good reason not to adhere to the code because that will show up and we have you know, a whole annotated code that tells you the thousands and thousands of times the code gets pulled out in, in courtrooms. So, so you need to understand what it is that you're promising uh, to do. So that's swearing an oath. Number three. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Lectures. Uh, we often call these grand rounds. Um, and the, the good thing about them is that uh, lectures, uh, if they are in a, in a good venue with clear support from the leadership, they convey something. They convey that the issues are important. But as all of you sitting here uh, probably already know, uh, you will walk out of this room with very little new knowledge. That's just a fact. Um, and no matter how good the speakers are, it is really hard to really ingrain knowledge through a didactic lecture and change practice patterns. You know, we've studied this kind of stuff. People don't change their practice patterns after a lecture. So um, it's the, it is true, of course, you know, you can get one good idea out of a lecture and run with it and it turns into something wonderful. Um, but lectures are not a terrific way of, uh, of teaching or of learning. They have minimal uh, lasting effect. Um, but, as I said, if they're attended by the leadership, if they're named lectureships and so on, it can have an impact uh, at, in terms of establishing the culture of the organization. Uh, number seven? Seven, honor codes. Um, honor codes I like in particular because they're usually written by the students and revised each year, or at least there's an opportunity for revision each year. And they make the students think about the ethics of being a medical student. It's not the same exactly as the ethics of being a doctor, but it's the ethics of doing what I am actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So it starts to inculcate what we often call mindfulness. And I'm sure you guys have talked about mindfulness in practice as well. Um, but it's the idea of recognizing that the culture of your organization is created moment by moment by moment by moment in all the little things and decisions that we do. And knowing that being cognizant of that in all the little decisions is something you want to try and build early on. And having students sit down and develop a code of conduct or revise the code of conduct each year is an opportunity for them to, de to begin to develop uh, mindfulness and, and to talk about the idea of shared norms of behavior. And even, again, this idea of some, what, what you might call the, pro the paradox of professional autonomy, that in fact professional autonomy is a constraint on individual liberty. Um, number six. Six or five? Six. Six. Case-based learning. Um, so this is where uh, you have um, vignettes. <coughs> and you use those vignettes, taken often from real practice, but they can also be hypothetical, and you dig into them. This is using narrative, using novels, using film, using poetry. There, uh, this could be an entire lecture on its own, but I think that is a terrific way. I will tell you that um, people have looked at this, and it turns out that a third of medical students think this is the best part of medical school. And a third of medical students think it's the stupidest part of medical school. <laughs> and a third could take it or leave it. So it will not, and this incidentally is one of the reasons why we are spending more and more energy trying to figure out how to pick the right people to come into medical school. 
Um, and we're revising five minutes. Five minutes? Five ideas. It'll work perfectly. Um, so, case based learning. Um, number four, into. Five. Okay, five. <laughs> <laughs> Integrated. I am. I, I'm. Okay. Okay, five. Um, <laughs> integrated case-based learning. We were talking about this at, uh, at our breakfast table this morning, and I, I'm sorry if this analogy doesn't work, but let me tell you um, how I talk about this in medical teaching. Because typically the way medical ethics has been taught, um, which is where the professionalism curriculum is often lodged, has been a lecture on Friday afternoon. Now. I don't have to say a lot about that, except that um, it's not bad to have a lecture about medical ethics. There is content here. There is, you know, there's knowledge base that needs to be conveyed. But what ends up happening is this sort of siloization, and then people end up going through the rest of their curriculum, and they don't hear about ethics and professionalism, and it feels like that's the real curriculum, and this is the fake curriculum or what sometimes people call the hidden curriculum takes over, right? The curriculum that is the reflection of the culture of medical practice, rather than the ideals that are espoused in the lecture hall. So integrated case-based learning means you take ethics and professionalism teaching points and you put them into histopathology cases or you put them into microbiology cases or gross anatomy cases. Right? So you, you can still have a lecture, but then when you're talking about hepatitis and looking at the slides, part of the case is about how this guy hasn't told his wife about his hepatitis. And you're taking care of him, and his viral load has just gone to this. And so that's the kind of thing I'm talking about, where you actually blend a little bit of ethics and professionalism into the rest of the curriculum. And the analogy I use is acid-base disorders in medicine. We always have a lecture on acid-base disorders. These are electrolyte disturbances, sodium, potassium, chloride, that kind of thing. Um, it's, a, it's a small lecture, maybe a few days, um, but you can't do pulmonary medicine or GI or cardiology or neurology without bumping into acid-base problems. So you learn a little here, but it gets drilled in over and over and over again that these issues come up all the time in actual practice. And that is why I think integrated case-based learning is, is where we need to go. Okay, so I just used up most of my five minutes on that one. But that's fine, because the rest of these are harder to arrange. Um, narrative reflection. This is case-based learning based on the student's actual own lived experience. So this is reflective writing exercises. Uh, I, I won't give you all of the examples, but we could talk about this maybe in, in Q&A. Different ways to organize this, but it allows students to reflect on their own personal experiences together. Um, number, where are we, three? Okay. Um, recognizing that we teach professionalism when we teach related skills. Um, I don't know if that's clear, but let me just give you examples. Uh, we have courses now in communication skills. We have courses in cross-cultural issues in medicine. We have courses in teamwork and leadership. Those are professionalism courses. That's what it means to be a professional. So acknowledging and recognizing that those kinds of coursework are our professionalism curriculum is, uh, is very important. Number two, mentoring and role modeling. Uh, very important, happens all the time, but usually completely unintentional. And this actually ties back to the um, narrative reflections. If you can get students in their narrative reflections to start thinking more explicitly about the role modeling that they are seeing, for good and for bad, that can be a tremendously powerful teaching experience. Because if they take the time to say, you know, I saw an intern do today something that I want to remember to do when I'm an intern. 
and they put that to writing, it's a different learning experience. And finally, number one, building structures and systems that make professionalism easier. This is where um, we need to talk about things like um, it doesn't matter how much I want to communicate well with my uh, Portuguese speaking patient, if I can't get an interpreter, my ability to carry out my professional responsibilities is almost impossible. And there are dozens and dozens of examples of ways in which our financing system, the delivery structures that we have, the organizations in which we work, make it hard to live up to our professional promises. And that is not an easy task. It's not something that individual doctors can accomplish on their own. This is where the American Medical Association, where organizations, systems need to be in the professionalism conversation. But how do we make it easy for doctors to do the right thing? And I think, I assume there are analogies uh, in law as well, but there's a, a huge and burgeoning field of study now on organizational dynamics and professionalism and how financing and structures of care can make it easier or harder to be a professional.